arising from the simultaneous experience of love and hatred, together with bitter envy for a third person. The man who wrote these words had certainly suffered the emotions they described, and it seems unlikely they were all on account of a twelve-year-old girl. Why? In his Treatise on the Correction of Understanding, Spinoza mentions, without giving specific details, a traumatic experience which transformed his life. I understood myself plunged into great peril, and in dire need of pursuing a remedy, however uncertain its outcome, with all my energy. I was like a sick man with a fatal disease who is faced with death if he does not find a cure. This prompted him to divert his energies toward a love for the eternal and infinite, which alone feeds the mind pleasure and frees it from all pain. For this reason it is much to be desired and should be sought with all our might. This love occurs in Spinoza's philosophy as one of his most uplifting poetic concepts, Amor Intellectualis Dei, the intellectual love of God. From what we know of Spinoza, it seems unlikely that he would have viewed heterosexual love as a fatal disease which had to be avoided with all our might, but any further Freudian conjectures would need to be based on more knowledge than we actually have of his life and personality. Not long after the putative episode with Clara, the Van den Ende College closed down, when its headmaster unexpectedly disappeared to France in the time-honoured manner of private school headmasters. Here he eventually came to a sorry end when he involved himself in an inept plot to overthrow Louis XIV and set up a utopian republic, which resulted in him being publicly hanged. Sometime during the 1650s, Spinoza began to learn the trade of lens grinding. Lenses were much in demand in Holland at the time. They were needed for microscopes in the expanding diamond trade, nautical telescopes, and reading spectacles, which, like 1,000cc motorcycles today, were rapidly becoming a fashionable accoutrement of middle age. After giving up teaching, Spinoza was to support himself financially by grinding lenses for the rest of his life. It is said that he became highly adept at this trade, and that his lenses were much sought after. The former claim may well be just a piece of mythology, but we know for certain that the latter is true, though in a way which didn't benefit Spinoza in the least. During the nineteenth century, when the selling of mementos of the famous became something of a boom industry— an Amsterdam antique dealer named Cornelius van Halvien began selling lenses ground by Spinoza to wealthy Jewish businessmen, visiting German professors and other collectors. These period lenses were not of a particularly high quality, and it's now been calculated that van Halvien must have sold several hundred of them. Perhaps he stumbled across a warehouse full of lenses which Spinoza hadn't quite finished working on. Spinoza now retired to the country to do some serious grinding. Lenses and original ideas began to appear in equal number. By this time his few friends were largely Remonstrants, a Christian sect similar to the Mennonites, whose independent, God-fearing ways succeeded in uniting all other Dutch Christians against them. It was also around this time that Spinoza Christianized his name to Benedict, which, like Baruch, also means blessed but there's no suggestion that he became a Christian. Spinoza eventually found lodgings with a remonstrant surgeon named Hermann Hohmann in the village of Rainsburg, which in those days was a remote spot on the banks of the Rhine outside Leiden. This house still stands, opposite a potato patch, in the quiet suburban street now known as Spinoza Lahn. Spinoza's room must have looked out over the flat countryside of fields and canals, which still stretch beneath the grey skies toward the distant horizon. Here Spinoza wrote two works which were to be seminal to his entire philosophy. One was a geometric version of Descartes' Principles of Philosophy. This was the vast rambling work that the French philosopher had produced toward the end of his life, into which he had poured all his philosophic and scientific theories. Spinoza's idea was to transform Descartes' thinking into a series of geometric proofs, which everyone would immediately be able to see were either right or wrong. Spinoza was deeply affected by Descartes' thinking, which had transformed philosophy in a more drastic way than any other philosopher has achieved before or since. But if Spinoza was to do good and original philosophy of his own, it was imperative for him to distance himself from the overwhelming influence of Descartes. This he achieved 
by reducing Descartes' delightful and lucid style to a rubble of almost impenetrable mathematics. The other book Spinoza wrote at this time was A Short Treatise on God, Man, and His Well-Being. Written in Dutch, it contains many of the ideas which were soon to appear in his mature philosophy. Unfortunately, when Spinoza came to write this philosophy, he decided against writing it in easily readable Dutch, and instead chose Latin, contorting this into the geometric style to which he had reduced Descartes' work. This has rendered his masterpiece, the Ethics, virtually unreadable. The entire work is broken up like a piece of Euclidean geometry into a series of definitions, axioms, propositions, and proofs. Viz. Definition. 1. A book is defined as something you can read. 2. Style is defined as the way in which an author chooses to write a book. Axioms. 1. We read a book because we are interested in finding out what the author has to say. 2. The style of a book plays a major role in its readability. Proposition. This style is unreadable. Proof. It is likely that most people have already given up reading this proof. See Axiom 1. If you have read this far, it is certain that you will not read much farther if I continue to use this style. See Axiom 2. Therefore this style is unreadable. QED. And so on, for more than two hundred pages. Even shipwrecked prisoner of six virgins couldn't withstand this kind of treatment. Not surprisingly, few managed to reach the end of the ethics. Part 5. Proposition 42, with its proof, which involves references to five previous propositions, one previous definition, and the corollaries to two further proofs. QED. And one person who did manage to make it to the end, Leibniz, claimed that although Spinoza's entire philosophic system is closely linked, not all its proofs follow one another with precise mathematical rigour. So there are a few unexpected twists in the plot. You just have to know where to look for them. But what precisely is the plot? Spinoza starts with eight definitions. These set out the basic assumptions of his universe and his philosophy. They define 1. A thing which is its own cause. 2. A thing which is finite in its own kind. 3. Substance. 4. Its attributes. 5. Its modes. 6. God. 7. Freedom. 8. Eternity. As we can see from the very nature of these definitions, Spinoza starts by regarding the world from an extremely rational and abstract point of view. This becomes even more apparent when we look at some of the definitions themselves. A thing which is its own cause, causa sui, I understand as something whose essence involves existence, and whose nature cannot be conceived except as existing. A thing is finite, in suo genere finito, when it can be limited by another thing of the same nature. For example, a body is said to be finite because we can always conceive of another larger body. Similarly, a thought is limited by another thought. However, body cannot be limited by thought, nor thought by body. Spinoza goes on to define two concepts which are all important for his system, God and Eternity. By God, Deus, I understand an absolutely infinite being, that is, a substance consisting of infinite attributes, each of which expresses eternal and infinite essence. By eternity, eternitas, I understand existence itself, conceived as following necessarily from the definition of the thing which is eternal. Explanation For existence so conceived is an eternal truth, inasmuch as it is the essence of the eternal thing. Therefore it cannot be explained by duration or time, although duration can be conceived as without beginning or end. From these definitions, Spinoza proceeds by way of Euclidean proofs to construct a necessary, deterministic, and irrefutable system which includes the entire universe. Every feature of existence is logically necessary, and every consistent logical possibility must exist. Modern physics has now shown that logically inconsistent systems can also exist, as in the quantum theory of light, so Spinoza's universe would today be in the dark. Spinoza's universe was pantheistic, that is, the universe is God and vice versa. He refers to it as Deus sive natura, God or nature. This is the only substance. 
But this God universe has an infinite number of attributes. We are capable of perceiving only two of these attributes, extension and thought. These two attributes make up our world, much like two dimensions, and we remain unaware of the infinite, minus two, remaining dimensions. Spinoza manages to overcome the great problem which defeated Descartes, namely, how does the mind, which works by reason, interact with the body, which works by mechanics? According to Spinoza's system, mind and body are the same individual, which is conceived now under the attribute of thought, and now under the attribute of extension. Mind and body are merely different aspects of the same thing, Deus sive natura perceived under just two of his infinite attributes. Our apprehension is limited to just two of God's infinite attributes, but these both conform to the logic of the whole. The order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things. Cause and effect are linked as rigidly and irreversibly as the processes of reason. Thus, in the vastness of Spinoza's infinite universe, cause and effect become part of a greater logical necessity. Our world of extension is logically determined, its chains of cause and effect are logically necessary, irreversible, and undivertible, no different from the necessary sequence of logic which takes place in the mind. In just the same way, finite things proceed necessarily from infinite substance, yet they remain part of Deus sive natura, God or nature. Under such circumstances it may appear superfluous to ask, how do we know this divine being exists? Consider the world we perceive if such a divine being did not exist. Without this backup, we would inhabit a world devoid of metaphysical substance, a blindly unfolding universe. Nowadays many of us feel able to live with such a world, but Spinoza could not. He needed to prove the existence of his Deus sive natura, and to do this he chose a proof characteristic of his ambivalent stance between the hierarchy of medieval certainty and the brave new world of the emerging age of reason. The ontological argument was a medieval favorite for proving the existence of God. Put simply, it stated that the idea of God is the greatest possible idea of which we can conceive. If this idea doesn't include the attribute of existence, then there must be an even greater idea exactly like it which does. Thus the greatest of all possible ideas must exist, otherwise an even greater idea would be possible. QED. God exists. Spinoza used several variations of this argument in his discussion of the unique infinite substance which he identified as God or nature. First he takes the thought of substance. So, if someone says that he has a clear and distinct, that is to say, true, idea of substance, and that he nevertheless doubts if such a substance exists, this would be just the same as if he said that he has a true idea, but nevertheless suspects it may be false. From this it follows, since existence appertains to the nature of substance, its definition must of necessity involve existence, and therefore from its mere definition its existence can be concluded. So much medieval sophistry? Skeptics of this approach should note that it remains very much a part of modern thinking. Contemporary scientists have proposed a similar argument to account for several central notions, including the existence of the Big Bang and the elusive theory of everything, or unified theory. No less a figure than Stephen Hawking asked, Is the unified theory so compelling that it brings about its own existence? Such argument suggests the inevitable conclusion. The universe must be the way it is, and had to be created, because no other universe, or lack of one, was possible. Spinoza would certainly have recognized this metaphysical argument, and as a supreme metaphysical idea, Spinoza's Deus sive natura belongs in the Big Bang category. Its Euclidean mathematics may have been superseded, but its compelling beauty remains undeniable. Despite Spinoza's determined geometric efforts, his metaphysical system exhibits many profoundly poetic features. Suffice to mention but a few. The aim of the wise should be to try and see the universe as God sees it, sub specie eternitatis, beneath the aspect of eternity. Every human body is part of God's body, thus when we harm others, we harm ourselves. 
The happiness of each of us depends on the happiness of all. The universe cannot be explained by reference to anything else, even God, because it is God. The universe is thus without meaning, yet at the same time is its own 